jump into this new series called King of Hearts. Let me ask you, uh, how many of you ever really wanted something really badly? Anybody? Uh, just real quick, just tell me what it was. Bacon? Okay. A car, a guitar, a guitar, a Mustang. Food. Now, how many of you, after you, uh, you maybe got that thing, um, it ended up being something you really, it wasn't what you thought it would be? Anybody? Does that have anybody? Mustangs are expensive. That's a true story. So when I was a sixth grader, there are two things that I wanted uh, the Christmas of my sixth grade year. One of them was an original NES Game Boy. Monochrome, four AA batteries, cartridge games, beauty. I got it. I, it was probably the funniest Christmas story in my family's history of the, when I thought I was getting something else and I got the Game Boy and I was so excited. And that's why I'm really good at packing, packing boxes, uh, packing trucks, packing cars, because I spent then the next about seven years playing Tetris nonstop on that Game Boy. And in fact, that Game Boy survived into my adulthood until I passed it on to my nephew, who destroyed it within about two weeks. Uh, yeah, vintage, classic Game Boy. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted when I was in sixth grade was a telescope, which I ended up getting for my, my birthday. You know, my birthday's in January, so whatever I didn't get for Christmas, I usually always got uh, for, for my birthday, you know? And so this is pretty much, that's, the, that's pretty much the telescope I got as a sixth grader, and I thought, man, this is going to be so cool. I'm going to be able to see, like, details of planets. I'm going to look at the moon. I'm going to discover new stars. I'm going to become, like, a junior astronomer. It's going to be amazing. And uh, I got this telescope, and I quickly went out. And I told you guys my birthday is in uh, January. And you guys know in Kansas in January, it's not really telescoping weather. You know what I mean? So as a sixth grader, I couldn't go far. My parents had a slab of concrete in the backyard, and so I could set up my telescope on that slab, and being in the middle of the city, we had a lot of light pollution, couldn't see much. Also, taking a warm telescope from a nice warm house to a January evening, guess what immediately happens to all of the uh, lenses and the, and, and the mirrors and everything in that telescope? They get foggy. They get foggy. I also learned that it's really hard. There's a little sighting scope on top of that, and it's got these little set screws, and you're supposed to be able to, like, put it on something and then look at your telescope, and then you sight it in with that. So, like, I could sight in, like, a stoplight three blocks away and get it in the telescope, easy peasy. But then when you magnify that by, I don't know, a thousand million billion and trying to look at a star, like a specific star in the sky, like, oh, that's not a star, that's Mars. Let me see if I can find it. Find it in my spot telescope. Then I look at my regular telescope and I'm looking in the completely wrong part of the universe. Because it's really hard to sight in a telescope, especially when it's foggy and covered in, and it's cold. And then you're outside and then you immediately get cold and you can't sight it in because it's too cold. And on top of that, everything turns upside down in a telescope. So the thing that I really thought I wanted... I quickly found out I didn't want. And guess where that telescope lived for, uh, I don't know, like the next decade? Under my bed. It lived under my bed for probably 10 years. I finally sold it at a pawn shop for like $20 in California just because I didn't want to, I wanted to stop moving with the telescope. It had gone so many places with me. And its final home was in California. So uh, anybody had that experience? Like you really wanted something and it turned out to not be what you want. I remember Shira one time, what was that hummus she wanted? Black bean hummus? Yes. She thought she really wanted black bean hummus from Radius. Taylor had to go get the black bean hummus, and then she didn't like the black bean hummus. It was not good. It was, it was horrible. She talked about that black bean hummus for like weeks, leading up to Taylor finally getting the black bean hummus. Didn't like it. So, um, you know, these things happen. So tonight we're going to look at a story in Israel's history, and the title of this uh, tonight's message is Who's the King? And so in the Old Testament, if you have your Bible or a Bible app, I will encourage you to follow along. If you don't, I've put the verses uh, in your notes. And so um, we, if you are unfamiliar, the Old Testament largely tells a history of the nation of Israel, right? So these are God's chosen people, and this whole nation started with the call of one man. Anybody know him? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. 
So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. So Father Abraham is the uh, patriarch. He is the founding father of Judaism. And so he had a son, right? Yeah, okay. So then, uh, then we have uh, his son had how many sons? Two sons. And then one of those sons had how many sons? Twelve. You guys are really, this is not your strong suit. I should have made this the game. Like the family history of Israel, this is the game tonight. No, then, then out of those 12, we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And so this one man, Abraham, his family began to expand. They go into Egypt, right? They are slaves then for 400 years, and Moses leads them out in the parting of the Red Sea and blah, 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 right? So I'm, I'm, that's not really blah, blah, blah. That's, maybe I was talking to the kids about uh, Hotel Transylvania, blah, 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 too much. So um, this special people, out of all the people on the earth, these were God's people, right? And so um, in their history, after they had left um, Egypt, they were slaves. They, God brought them into their land, which is known as the promised land. It was promised by God. And today we know that land as Israel because of the nation of Israel. And um, so God chose them and he delivered them. And when they took the nation for themselves, they defeated all these different um, gods. And, and, and they were set apart because they worshiped one God in a world where people worshiped multiple gods. Okay, so they stood unique in history as this monotheistic people for, for so long. Uh, they, were, they were surrounded by polytheists, and these people worshiped gods made out of wood and stone and, and maybe leather, um, animal parts kind of melded together were the gods of the other nations, but the nation of Israel worshiped the God, the maker of heaven and earth, and it set them apart even more. And at this part of their history that we're going to look at, they had no king. There was no uh, king over the nation of Israel. Instead, God chose a prophet to speak for him to the people. Now, as the people were coming out of um, Egypt, who did I say their prophet was? Say it louder. Moses, right? And then Moses passed the reign off to someone else. Anybody know his name? Joshua, right? And Joshua led the people, led the generation for a while. And at this point in their history, the, the status, the mantle of prophet had been handed off to a guy named Samuel. Okay? So Samuel is the prophet. And you think how, how unique he was. Of all the nations of the earth, God chose the Israelites. Of all of the Israelites, God chose Samuel. And from a very young age, this man, God spoke to him. He knew God's voice and he would speak to the people. And so we uh, see, you know, how unique that is. And I want you to know as followers of Jesus, you are made and saved to be unique. Right? You're not made and saved to be like everybody else around you. In fact, you think of all the gods that the people around Israel worship. They were made of stone. They were made of wood. They were fashioned with leather or gold or whatever. And you think of the things that people worship in our world. You know, you could easily see that, that things like that are made out of metal. Mine's actually got some wood on it, but, right? People worship their phones, Right? You think of, of things that were maybe at one time made of leather, like sporting equipment, and they worship sports. You think of things that are made of paper, like money, and they worship that. People today worship things made out of fabric and textiles in the clothes that they put on their body. They uh, worship other idols, like popularity or romance or security. But we are not made and saved to worship those things that the people around us are worshiping. You and I are made and saved to worship God, the maker of heaven and earth, who created all that stuff. It all comes from him. But here's the problem. I want you to write this down. We'd rather worship what we see than what we believe. That was the problem with the nation of Israel that we're going to look at tonight. But it's the same problem with us. We have the same problem. We would rather worship the things that we can 
see instead of the things that we say that we believe. So many people say they believe in God. You know, the Grammys just happened. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ever watch the Grammys. Some really good music gets rewarded some years. Some really horrible music, in my personal opinion, gets rewarded. And so I don't see a point in this. Uh, it's really self-aggrandizing. It's just artists making themselves look better. Uh, that's kind of what all those award shows do. They, it's themselves making themselves look better. So I don't really follow any of it, but I'm sure that there were some really filthy mouth artists getting up there saying, oh, praise and glory to God, number one, thank you, and they're holding a little golden statue. Ironic, right? They're holding a little idol, and they're making themselves look better, and, and, and at the same time giving lip service to give God glory, which really makes no sense at all. But that's what would happen. We'd rather worship what we see than what we believe. And we say we believe in God, yet we really uh, don't worship him sometimes. And in this story we're going to look at tonight, the nation of Israel was at a crossroads. They were at an important turning point in their history because they were surrounded, like I said, by other nations and all the other nations around them, the Canaanites, the, the, uh, the Hittites, the Perizzites, all these different people, Amorites and, and Amalekites, they all had kings. And the nation of Israel had no king. They had Samuel, God's prophet. And they came to this point where they, again, they'd rather worship what they can see than what they believe. And so they said, we want a king. And, and you know, that's kind of the same way we are. We see what other people have and we want that, don't we? Like if you had an Xbox 360 and your friends all have Xbox Ones, do you want an Xbox 360 anymore? Katera does. But most people don't because they, there's better games on Xbox One. I can play better stuff or, or whatever your gaming system is. You know, if, if I, I've got this sweet uh, Kindle Fire 10 I, I got on sale, and I'm pretty happy with it. But when I see uh, my friend, you know, my friend Corey's got an iPad Pro. And he's got to carry it around in this giant case, and he pulls it out like a huge billboard and lays it on the table, and it's like this giant, beautiful piece of machinery. It's like practically the size of that computer back there. And he's ready. He's like doing all these things. And he's walking around mixing sound. I'm like, man, my, my little Amazon Kindle doesn't look so good compared to that iPad Pro, does it? You know? If your friend starts dating, then, hey, wait a second. I, I don't want to be alone. And to you, I will say, watch Carl's video one more time. Single life's the best life, or be the third wheel. That's right. But we want what other people have. That's our problem. I want you to write this down. Give us a king. This is what Israel said. Give us a king. In our, in our Bibles, if you have your Bible or Bible app, 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where we're going to start tonight. Verses 4 and 5 of what you see on the screen here. And look, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and approached Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, look, you're old and your sons don't follow your ways. So now appoint over us a king to lead us. Look at that last line. Just like all the other nations have. Every one of us has made that statement before. I want it just like everyone else has. Israel wanted a king so they could be like the nations around them. The problem was, here's the thing, the nations around them didn't have God's voice speaking directly to them. That the nation of Israel had Samuel, God's voice. See, they said the grass is greener on the other side of the border. They've got a king, we need a king. But the problem was Samuel was getting older and they knew that Samuel's sons couldn't take his place because they were pretty evil. They were, they were not good people. In fact, God had to, he, he not killed them. He he assassinated those two guys because they were evil. They, they, they didn't respect God or his word or his people. And so the people needed a leader to fill Samuel's shoes because they're sure, they're surely he's going to come to the point where he dies. And they thought, what's the harm in asking? The problem really wasn't in them asking the question. The problem really lived in the motivation behind the question. And that's always where the problem lies. It's the motivation that's driving the action. And I want you to know that God is no fool. God could see right through their question. He could see exactly to the motivation. In fact, that's what 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20 says to us. It says, God is greater than our conscience and knows all things. 
That's an attribute of God. He is all-knowing. And when we think that we're being so slick and so sly, God, you know, I just, I want, you know, uh, I want this thing because I'm going to be able to do so much for you for good. God, if you just gave me a brand new iPhone uh, 10, I would be able to share such great Bible verses on Snapchat and Instagram. And I'm going to be like just telling people about you on social media. And I'm going to take better pictures because that has a better camera. And God, you'll be glorified through my better pictures. And God sees right through that. He's like, no, you just want an iPhone 10 because you want to try and show off. That's not what it's about. God can see behind our request. The second thing I want you to write down tonight is this. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. How many of your parents have ever said that to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, we continue reading in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, and it says this, The Lord said to Samuel, Remember, this is God talking to Samuel. He says, do everything the people request of you. For it is not you they have rejected, but it is me that they have rejected as their king. God saw through the question, God saw through the request for them to have a king. And he said, it's not you, Samuel, that they're rejecting. And Samuel had led the nation of Israel for a lot of years. And I'm sure that this decision of the people probably hurt him. Because he had been their leader for God. He had been speaking for God. But God basically says, listen, Samuel, this isn't because you're like the worst prophet in the world or that our structure has failed us in any way. This is happening right now because the people want to trust somebody else. They're not just looking for a king. They're looking for someone else to be the king of their hearts. Right? That's basically kind of what God is saying to Samuel. And it's so true of so many people. So many people are looking for someone to be the king of their heart. And I think that absolutely breaks the heart of God. When we look somewhere else for fulfillment and God is saying, I'm all you need. When we look somewhere else for leadership and God says, I'll lead you to green pastures. I'll lead you beside still waters. I'll restore your soul. And we go to something that's gonna break our soul and steal our worth because God is the only play only person worthy to be the king of our hearts God is the only true king that can rule in our hearts and yet we so we look other places I want you to write this down sometimes it's hard to trust that God's plan for us is better than what we see around us sometimes it's harder to trust that God's plan for us is truly better than the stuff that we see around us. But here's the thing. God granted the Israelites' request. He says, you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. And in fact, if you continue reading, this is what God gave the Israelites a warning. Oh, you want a king? Well, let me tell you what this king is going to be like. Just to warn you up front, I don't want to hear any complaining because this is what you said you wanted, but this is what you're actually asking for. And look at what he says in 1 Samuel 8, verses 11 and 17. He said, he said, here are the policies of the king who will rule over you. He will conscript your sons and put them in his chariot forces and in his cavalry. They will run in front of his chariot. He will appoint for himself leaders of thousands and leaders of fifties, as well as those who plow his ground, reap his harvest, and make his weapons for war and his chariot equipment. He will take your daughters to be ointment makers, cooks, and bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his own servants. He will demand a tenth of your seed and of the produce of your vineyards and give it to his administrators and his servants. He will make your male and female servants as well as your best cattle and your donkeys and assign them for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will be his servants." He says, you know what, you're, you're asking for a king. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take your kids and put them into his army and make them fight his wars. He's going to take your best people and make them plow his fields and harvest his crops. And you know what, when you go to work, guess what he's going to require of you? Taxes. He's going to take a portion of everything that you make so that he can feed his household and run his government because everything that that requires has to happen. And so you're asking for this king and it's going to not be what 
what you think it is. It's going to be hard and it's going to cost you something when you look for somebody else to be the king. And that's really what always happens. Whenever we seek something else to be the king of our heart other than God, it always ends up costing us more than we want to spend. Every single time, it costs you more than you want to spend. You know, you think, you know, hanging out with your friends, being with your friends, doing what they want to do, man, that should really give me life. What is that thing everyone's saying right now that does not give me joy? What is that saying? Pleasure, I don't know, what is, who is that? Some, some, I can't remember. I shouldn't have gone off script right there. I should not have. Yeah, that doesn't give me joy. I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me just say this. Doing what your friends want to do, that you think that's going to give you life, but instead it costs you to lose your identity, right? You think that spending all this time on, on social media, on Snapchat or on Instagram, man, that's really going to, that's going to show me who I am and give me life. And then it ends up stealing your joy because all you do is compare yourself to everybody else's filtered image that they're not really proving that it's true. You think, man, engaging in some sort of sexual activity will make me feel loved, but instead it makes you feel ashamed and used. Getting all the best clothes and all the best phones and all the best stuff is going to make me truly feel alive, but it actually just makes me empty, wanting some more. You see, Israel wanted a king, but they didn't know what following their new king Saul would really cost them. And I want you to look at what Samuel said to Saul and the Israelites about their new decision. We fast forward a couple of chapters here to 1 Samuel chapter 12. Um, Saul had become king at this point. He had been established. The people loved him. They thought everything's going great. Uh, and then he messed up. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. Samuel came to the people and said, Don't be afraid. You have indeed sinned. However, don't turn aside from the Lord. Serve the Lord with all your heart. You should not turn aside after empty things that can't profit and can't deliver since they're empty. You see, it's amazing that even in the midst of like this really bad decision, all the nation of Israel had turned away from God and wanted this king. And then the king they so desperately wanted failed them. And God didn't come down with like this Thor hammer and smash their heads. He's not like Zeus. He didn't just start hurling lightning bolts and destroy the whole nation. God instead said, you know what? Don't be afraid. He was gracious to them. He extended mercy to them in this time. Instead of beating them down for their stupidity and rem he, he reminding them that that, yeah, your decisions are heartbreaking, but I'm going to offer you grace. I want you to write this down. It's never too late to make Jesus the king of your heart. It's never too late to make Jesus the king of your heart. No matter what we've tried to put in his rightful place, he offers us grace and mercy. You know, it's not that Jesus is asking for perfection. What he's asking for is your heart. Your whole heart, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he's asking that you would trust him with it. Say, Jesus, I want you to be my king. You know what? There's some parts of our hearts that need to be changed. And guess what? A good king is going to help us work through the process of change and transformation. There's some of our parts, uh, parts of our heart that, that are, are wicked and bad, and they need to be removed. And guess what? Our good king, Jesus, he'll come in and he'll help us to remove the things of our lives that, that aren't pleasing to him and replace them with things that are pleasing to him. But it's never too late to ask Jesus to be the king of your heart. If you've given your heart away to something else, ask something else to be the king, tonight is the night at a chance for repentance. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are such a gracious king. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are merciful and you're true. Lord, you're so good. I pray that tonight, if there's anything that we have allowed to be on the throne of our hearts that is not you, is not of you, that tonight you would help us to see that we need to remove it and we ask you to be the king of our hearts. Lord, I thank you that you don't beat us down. 
when we've made mistakes. You don't punish us to harm us. Lord, instead, your word says your kindness leads us to repentance. Your goodness draws us to be close to you. Lord, I pray that you would just have your way in these last couple of minutes that we have together. Speak to our hearts. Let us know your voice and let us respond appropriately. We pray in your name, Jesus.